Well, welcome. Um, yes. Thanks for coming this evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Legro. I'm the Vice Provost for Global Affairs here at the University of Virginia and a professor in politics. And uh, it is a great pleasure and honor to introduce um, uh, the topic tonight, uh, whatever happened to the Arab Spring? And you know, you know a great question when you don't know the answer. So uh, we're, we're hoping we're going to get some answers we're here. Answers. You're going to get some answers, <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, this panel is being put on uh, by the uh, Center for International Studies. Uh, the Center for International Studies is out to advance global research and learning at the University of Virginia with an emphasis on cross-university and multidisciplinary efforts. Uh, there's lots of upcoming events this spring. Uh, what's, what's up next, Majida? Do you remember? Yes, uh, we have a seminar series on uh, development. So. A seminar series on development, which I believe is Thursday, right? Thursday, the first one with uh, Ray Bloomberg and uh, Sam Cohn from uh, Texas A&M. Uh, Ray Bloomberg and Sam Cohn from Texas A&M. So uh, that'll be taking place Thursday. Thursday at 5 at uh, I told you. Thursday at 5 at 5.30? At 5 4.30, Thursday at 4.30 at Hotel A. So uh, we encourage you to come for that. Um, uh, encourage um, you to check out the grants page on the Center for International Studies. Uh, deadline for the next round of grants is March 5th. Um, and I just want to uh, uh, take a minute uh, to thank uh, Majida Bargash for, uh, for uh, doing an excellent job running uh, the uh, Center for International Studies. Uh, Majida is the interim director and is uh, put together this uh, panel uh, tonight. She's the director of the Morocco program, teaches in French. Uh, Majida, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to introduce the moderator tonight, uh, Professor uh, Libby Thompson. Uh, uh, Libby is associate professor of history and author of the forthcoming book, Just a Matter of Weeks, Justice Interrupted, The Struggle for Constitutional Government in the Middle East from Harvard University Press. Her first book, Colonial Citizens, Republican Rights, Paternal Privilege, and Gender in French, Syria, and Lebanon, won two National History Prizes. She has taught courses on the Arab Spring, French imperialism, and World War I in the Middle East, and is now working on a third book, Cinema and the Politics of Late Colonialism. Thanks for moderating, Libby. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay, welcome, and thank you for coming this evening um, to discuss whatever did happen to the Arab Spring, as many of you know. Uh, just two years ago that Hosni Mubarak stepped down and there was much joy in Tahrir Square. As a historian, I am fascinated to watch what is undoubtedly going to be one of the major moments in Middle Eastern history unfold before our eyes. Also as a historian, having finished the book that I just did, I know that the um, values and belief and faith and struggle for constitutional government runs deep in Middle Eastern countries and in the Arab world. Uh, the obstacles to success in the Arab Spring over the past two years, I doubt, have much to do with any ignorance of or lack of appreciation for democracy um, as a set of values or ideas or practice. And I look forward to hearing the uh, thoughts of the five scholars we've gathered together today on exactly what those obstacles are and how they might be overcome. We'll start uh, from bottom up. We'll uh, start with the more general talks and move to the more specific country studies. Each speaker will speak for 10 minutes. Please hold your questions, jot them down. We want to leave uh, plenty of room for a Q&A at the end. So, if you'll join me in welcoming our speakers, I will introduce first Professor William Quant, uh, uh, Professor of Politics at UVA. Bill? <clears throat> Thank you very much, Libby. Uh, as uh, Professor Thompson mentioned, it was just two years ago yesterday that uh, President Mubarak of Egypt was forced to step down to, uh, to abdicate his office. And I think, uh, at that moment, uh, the general view of uh, people who were witnessing these events in the Middle East, and certainly those of us who have followed Middle Eastern affairs for a long time, was really struck by um, the remarkable 
way in which mass protests, largely peaceful mass protests, had dislodged two regimes by that point in Tunisia and in uh, Egypt. And there was a, a feeling of that this was really a momentous period of potential change for the better uh, in the Middle East. Today, as I scan the headlines of various newspapers from the Arab world, it's a very different picture. There's much more pessimism. There are a lot of people asking what went wrong, uh, where are things headed. And I think it's, it's fair to say that our question of whatever happened to the Arab Spring is on the minds of uh, lots of people who are living these uh, very momentous uh, events um, that have unfolded since uh, uh, the downfall of the first of the regimes in Tunisia and then in Egypt. I want to make six very brief points since we are all constrained to uh, uh, a 10-minute deadline. First, I, I worry about uh, the kind of instant snapshot analysis of the Arab Spring, where you look at it as a moment in time and say, oh my gosh, it's failed, or correspondingly two years ago, wow, it's a wonderful revolution. Uh, it's the wrong way to think about this kind of a historical uh, development. Instead, I think you have to think of this as a very long play with many acts or a very complicated novel with many plot turns. Uh, and we don't know where it's going to end at this point. In fact, there aren't ends in history. Uh, but I think we have to be a little bit uh, restrained in passing a judgment on uh, the nature of the historical events that we're watching. Uh, secondly, I think there are some deep causes that are playing themselves out in these popular upheavals uh, against regimes that have manifestly governed very poorly, and particularly in the five cases that I think <coughs> are most uh, reflective of whatever the Arab Spring was two years ago, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, and Syria, the commonalities, uh, not identities, but commonalities were striking. First, there had were regimes in power that had essentially been there for 20, 30, 40 years with no change at the top. So power had become very personalized around Mubarak, the Assad family, Gaddafi, who had been in power for 40 years, uh, Salah in, in Yemen, and so forth. So there was a kind of focal point for people's anger. There was also a lot of concern that that had bred extraordinary corruption, which was true. Uh, in each of these cases, people knew of or thought they knew of egregious cases where power had led to uh, enormous abuses of, of that power to enrich the family, the ruling family, and so forth. There was anger at things like police, corrupt, uh, police brutality. And then there was the commonality throughout much of the region of the economic downturn that began to hit the region in about 2009. We felt the first wave in this country of the economic downturn 2008, 2009. It happened a little bit later in the Middle East, but it hit the Middle East pretty hard with escalating food prices, uh, inflation, uh, unemployment got worse. If you went to the region in 2009, 2010, people started, were complaining about economic issues in a way that had been perhaps not as obvious a little bit earlier. Then there was the Al Jazeera effect. Anything that was happening anywhere in the Arab world was being watched by millions and millions of Arabs at the same time. This created what Nathan Brown's colleague Mark Lynch called a kind of common Arab public sphere, so that what happened in one country would have some impact on the way people saw issues in another. And I think that was not irrelevant, and you can link that to the so-called social media effect of a young generation of people who were more connected, more aware, more literate, more politically savvy, more technologically savvy. Uh, and they brought some of that knowledge into the political arena uh, with them. Uh, my third basic point is that despite these commonalities that I think you can see playing out in each of the major countries, there were some fairly important differences in each of these cases. And that's the other general point to bear in mind. Each country, as these individual forces affected them, saw them play out in rather different ways, depending upon a number uh, of different things. Uh, first, 
Some countries had a kind of buffer. They had oil revenues that they could turn to. Algeria had billions and billions of dollars in the bank, and they increased the salaries of public employees almost the day that Ben Ali fell. It was as if you know, the biggest beneficiaries of Ben Ali's overthrow were not the Tunisian people, but the Algerian bureaucrats. Their salaries doubled overnight. And surprisingly, not surprisingly, they didn't pour into the streets in protest. They were actually rather pleased to be better off. Uh, so oil revenue is the only oil-rich country that did have an uprising. Uh, well, really the only one was, was Libya. You could say Bahrain in some, in some sense as well, but I think that's a, a rather different case. Second thing to look at is where and what kind of foreign intervention took place. Egypt and Tunisia, there was relatively little. Libya, a lot. Syria, some. Of course, Bahrain, a lot. And that has made some difference in each of these cases. Third point <clears throat> under this category, I would say, look at the recent history of violence <clears throat> in different countries. In places where there has been something like a civil war going on in the recent memory, Algeria, Iraq, Palestinian territories, not so much a civil war, well, somewhat, uh, and Lebanon, <clears throat> people were reluctant to go out into the streets another time. They had gone through enormous bloodletting in the previous decade or two. My next <clears throat> general point is that I think there are still some cases that we can <clears throat> be reasonably hopeful about if we think a little bit longer term than just what's going to happen next week. Uh, Tunisia has gone through a very rocky last uh, few weeks. There was a political assassination that caused a lot of uh, reaction. But the reaction is largely not playing itself out in a violent way in the streets. People are talking, including today, getting together to talk about how to get back into the political arena, how to get the Constitution finished, how to call new elections, and so forth. So I, I still think that Tunisia may turn out to be the f which, which was the first of these cases of, of mass uprisings against an entrenched authoritarian re regime, it may actually turn out to be a successful transition to a more open and uh, possibly uh, democratic new order, but it's going to take some time. Egypt, despite a very, very bizarre trajectory of getting from where they were to where they are today, which Nathan Brown knows more about than virtually anybody uh, outside of Egypt and more than a lot of Egyptians, I still think they have a chance. The system hasn't completely resulted in nobody talking to anybody else. Every now and then, they still get together and try to figure out how to get the transition back on some kind of reasonable track. Only two more quick points, and I think I might make it in your deadline. Uh, remember that every other major revolution, anything we consider a revolution, the Russian, the Chinese, the French, uh, the Iranian, all of these were followed by a lot of turmoil in the aftermath of the first phase. When the old order collapsed, it wasn't a nice, smooth transition to something new. It was a very contested struggle for power, often turning quite violent, and it took years, sometimes decades, before you could begin to see the contours of the new order. So we need to be a little bit patient. These things do not get resolved overnight. And my last point has to do with American policy, which is probably the only thing I know anything about uh, in some detail. There's not very much we can do to make a difference when these uh, deep historical processes start to play themselves out. We tried, in Egypt in particular, to steer the transition in a way that some people thought would have been advantageous to our interests. We didn't succeed. The way Egypt has turned out, and this is the country where we had the most influence, we give them almost $2 billion plus dollars a year in aid, we had close relations with the military, at each of the crucial moments, things did not go the way American policymakers wanted it to, at least on the big issues. And I think that's a reminder that the United States has limited influence over how this will unfold. Doesn't mean at the margin we can't sometimes exert some influence, but by and large, what people think in Washington doesn't matter all that much. My last point is beware of a lot of the pundits, and perhaps including some of us. Most people have 
who have been pontificating on the Arab Spring have made a lot of egregious misjudgments. And so I would, this is an argument for being a little bit modest as we try to understand a very complex uh, set of, of uh, major social, political, and perhaps even cultural changes taking place. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Ahmed Massadi, Secretary General of the Secretariat of the Union for the Mediterranean. Thank you very much. Good evening, uh, everyone. Is it, is it working? Uh, well, just I. I'd like to say that I'm, I'm no more the Secretary General of the Union for the Mediterranean. <coughs> uh, I, I am the former Secretary General, and uh, and today uh, I am a practitioner and uh, proud to be a UVA graduate uh, some 22 years ago, and the former uh, ambassador of my country. Um, let me uh, try in, in 10 minutes uh, to say the following points. To start with, uh, I'm not very sure about the terminology, the Arab Spring. This one's working if you want to change. Thank you. Why don't you? Okay. It's on. It's on. Okay. It's on, huh? Yeah. Thank you. Just pull it closer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I'm not sure about the terminology, the Arab Spring. Uh, I think that this is a, a Western making. Uh, probably referencing what happened in 1848 uh, uh, in Europe, uh, the so-called the Spring uh, of Nations. Um, uh, and, and I think that, you know, spring is seasonal and it ends with the season, and a revolution has to be aligned and to have uh, a head. What we've seen uh, for the first time, people flocking to the streets without leadership and without a head. This is why I think that the term Arab Spring is not very accurate. I like to call it the Arab Political Awakening, or APA. Now, in order for us to uh, uh, get a grasp with why did we have this uh, awakening, um, I think that we have always to remember four geopolitical uh, reasons. The first, there has been a total failure in peace and security, or in achieving peace and security in the greater Middle East area, including Afghanistan. Secondly, there has been also a failure to create any South-South integration or cooperation, in particular, in economic between the Arab countries. And uh, for instance, uh, uh, if you know that, you know, the, the rates of unemployment in the Arab world is about 25% today, and, uh, uh, and there are reports saying that it will go up to 28% in five years' time uh, for a population that 70% of which is under the age of 40. So basically, you either have an opportunity at your hand or a bomb. And that is what, what is happening. The third also geopolitical observation or cause is that we had a total failure in the Middle East peace process. Uh, between, you know, the Arabs and the Israelis. And finally, there is also a chronic failure by the uh, Arab uh, autocratic regimes to introduce any proper democracy or pluralism or freedoms in their countries. Now, those overarching reasons led the people to flock to the streets to call for their dignity, freedom, pluralism, and probably, and most importantly, their economic uh, prosperity and their better uh, uh, living uh, conditions. Um, now, I, I'd like to say that obviously we had some political and deep changes in certain countries such as Tunisia and Egypt and Yemen and Libya, and we have now, I would say, relevant uh, or relative less changes in countries like Jordan uh, and, uh, and possibly Morocco. Um, and also, of course, Bahrain and Kuwait. And of course, we have a political battle that is taking place in Syria. Um, in, in this context, I'd like to say that possibly the international community got surprised 
with what happened and with the evolution of things because it has always applied Western methodologies on us rather than to try to dig deeper into the exclusivities and the nature of the Arabian societies. And also, possibly it always made a mistake by looking uh, or having a perspective about the Arabian society through their God-given uh, leaders, you know, uh, uh, which is, in, in, in my point of view, this is an expired recipe, and I believe, you know, the West and the U United States should stop, you know, looking at the uh, inside of, of the Arabian societies through, their, through the eyes of their leaders. Um, in this context, those countries that were hit by the uh, Arab Spring or the Awakening will go through what we call a phase from democracy, uh, from autocracy to democracy through a phase or a state that is called anocracy. And this is a very critical, dangerous state for freedoms and for political reforms, meaningful ones, and also for human rights issues. Possibly this is what we're seeing in Egypt, for instance, now. Now, I would like also to say that who said that the road for democracy would be a rosy one? At the end of the day, uh, you know, the, the road for revolutions or change is a very long one. And I believe that we need to look at what is happening in the Arab world in the context of uh, a learning process, a long learning process that will, will, uh, will take time to, to settle and, uh, and have the final outcomes. But in this context, I believe that the international community now needs to have a plan to reach what I call a civilized uh, um, um, uh, context to build on it or to use it as a foundation to build on it the upcoming Arab democratic project. This will lead me to talk about two or three elements that I believe also got us all confused and maybe uh, uh, sort of went back uh, uh, a bit when when uh, uh, when we are now examining what is happening in the, in, the, uh, in the Arab world, and in particular in the Arab Spring or Awakening. First, the political Islam and pluralism. We have to carefully understand what is happening, and we have actually uh, to, to come to terms with what exactly the Islamist groups want in the Middle East, in Egypt, in Tunisia, for instance. Are they serious? about a pluralism, a partisan system, whereby the political Islam is part or, a, or one member of other players or political factors? Or are they leading us to another authoritarian regime, except for this time that they extract their powers from divine rules, as opposed to you know, the dictatorships that we had in the past, usually you know, finding their legitimacy in the White House? So uh, that is one, one element that we, need, that we need to think about. The situation is very critical. Why? Take the example of Egypt, for instance. At the front line, we have the Islamic Brotherhood Front. This is a legitimate political party. Behind them, you have the Salafis. And behind them, you have the Jihadis. And the Jihadis lead us to Al-Qaeda. And Al-Qaeda is talking all of us. So it's critical, we need to, to make sure what is happening exactly in a country like Egypt or like Tunisia. And of course, by the way, like in Jordan. Now we have also incidents that we have to stop at. For instance, a very leading clergyman last week to call for uh, the legitimization of the killing of two leftist uh, Egyptian leaders, uh, Hamdin Sabahi and Muhammad al Baradi. Uh, that is very critical. Also, you know, the assassination that Professor just mentioned. Again, does that remind us of the, what I call political uh, liquidation that we had in Afghanistan? The same concepts? Those are issues that we have to carefully look at. But also I would like to say that the United States should not put or place all its bets on the Islamic democratic project in the region. And the United States should not summarize what is happening in Jordan, in Egypt, in Tunisia as between two parties, the state and its apparatus, 
and on the other end, the Islamic opposition. We do believe that there are other social, democratic, and progressive powers in the making that we need to look at and maybe enhance and empower. This is what I call the third track, or the third way in the Arab world. Now, um, I'm, I'm being reminded that I have one minute. Then the, I, I, will, I will go into another issue very quickly, that is regional chaos. And I see regional chaos coming from the gate of Syria. Now, there, it's very important. It's obvious that we need a political settlement. The military settlement uh, will not work. We have to make sure that that country is not divided. But at the same time, also, if a political settlement is underway, we have to make sure what will happen for the radical Islamist fighters who are there on that, in that country. Where are they going to go? For instance, if you take the example of Sana'i, uh, in Egypt, we have jihadis being trained there. And now, for instance, reports coming from Germany, this country is very worried that it's national. If they go back home, this will, be, this will pose a critical risk for that country. Also, from the gateway of Syria, we should not allow for the new clusteration or new clustering uh, of the region on ethnic bases. For instance, this crescent of Shiites and Sunnis. I believe that if we end up having the mushrooming of ethnic states in the region, then global security is going to be affected, of course, including, including that of the countries in the region, including Israel and including countries in, in Europe. So I believe that we have to be very careful when it comes to um, chaos, regional chaos, that could be, you know, presenting itself through the Syrian uh, door uh, uh, very, very soon. I should maybe finish by saying that also there has been some macroeconomic effects on our, our, our economies. For instance, you know, um, we had lots of problems in terms of the foreign currencies, you know, the, the countries in general, in terms of unemployment, in terms of poverty, in terms of uh, uh, trade, in terms of bilateral investment, in terms of tourism. And this is why you see that there is a tendency from the people in the region, probably from the international community, to take a pause and go back a bit because obviously, you know, things are not working on economic basis very well in, in, uh, in, in our countries. The last point that I would like to end is that we don't have any other option. This is the hope for the Arab nation. This is the hope for the young men and women who flock to the street. And we have only to stay the course and maintain, you know, the rhythm and support what is happening in the region. And possibly this is an idea for the United States that maybe it should start considering the establishment of a Marshall Fund for the APA to support what is happening, but I'm saying, into, I'm saying to support the meaningful reforms that the countries are taking, not the lip service that some Arab countries also are giving, possibly, you know, the example of Morocco and Jordan, you know, some, uh, some uh, cosmetic uh, uh, reforms here and there, but not, not meaningful. I will end at this note. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Nathan Brown, professor of politics at George Washington University and president of the Middle East Studies Association. President-elect. Elect. Uh, yeah, yeah. President-elect of the Middle East Studies yes. Association. Yes. Welcome. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to focus most of, or almost all of my remarks on Egypt. There's something a little bit unfair about giving, being given 10 minutes to talk about Egypt. It's, if I did the math right, that's eight seconds for every one million people. So I'm going to, I'm, what I'm going to do is to address that situation first by talking so fast that nobody can possibly understand me, and the second uh, by ignoring uh, Bill Kwan's suggestion that uh, pundits be modest. I'm going to be sweeping. Now, those two things should cancel each other out. I will say outlandishly broad things, but because I say them so fast, nobody will understand or remember them. Um, let me talk about the question, whatever happened to Arab Spring, and talk specifically about the Egyptian Revolution, and begin with a sweeping generalization about what this was about. This was about many, many, many different things. It was about a youth revolution. It was about, you know, generational. There were cultural aspects. But what it was about fundamentally at its essence, if I have to be brief, was about the rebirth of politics. Okay? First, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit in terms of personal impressions here. First time I went to Egypt, mid-1980s, I thought this is a country where politics went to die. Okay. Nobody talked about it. You open the newspaper, there's no politics. You go to a coffee house, they're watching soccer. Um, if you ta start talking about politics, people either get bored or nervous very, very quickly. That began to change, and it began to change in the 90s and 2000s in a way that wasn't necessarily visible outside the country. But I was struck by the way in which all sorts of... of, of, of 
uh, Egyptians from various uh, parts of the society found ways to get interested in public life about talking about politics. This was something and uh, th that, that, that uh, evolved very, very slowly. But what it allowed people to do was to develop, I think, a fairly powerful set of critiques of the kinds of problems that we've just heard people talk about. And what that critique boiled down to was the following. There's something fundamental, there's lots of fundamental things wrong with our society, with our economy, with our environment, and so forth and so on. And all of those cannot be fixed until we get the politics right that there, because we have societies in which political authority is monopolized by a few people for their own purposes, we'll never get anything right until we correct that. What, what was div in, in a sense, this was resuming, I'm very conscious of the fact that our, our uh, uh, discussion is being chaired by a historian and a historian who writes on the history of constitutionalism in the region, I guess. So the book is not out yet, so I cannot claim to have read it. Uh, but in some ways, this was a resumption of some conversations that had gone on earlier in the 20th century, actually dating back to the 19th century, and then had been extinct. They were revived, and they were revived with a sense of history, actually. You could get into discussions with each in with Egyptians about the, the merits of the 1923 Constitution. When I went to Egypt in the first place in the 1980s, nobody had even heard of this thing. People could talk about what we referred to as the Constitution in the, gar from, in the garbage can, a Constitution that was drafted in the mid-1950s and then shoved off and put on a shelf, and then finally a historian actually discovered it when somebody threw away a copy of it. These were the kinds of discussions you could have. What changed in January and February 2011 was that people stopped talking and started acting. And there was this incredible sense of possibility. But again, focusing on, as I say, getting the politics right. My favorite moment in the Egyptian revolution of January and February 2011 came when an Al Jazeera reporter stuck a microphone in front of an Egyptian demonstrator in Tahrir Square and said, what are you protesting for? And I, I knew what the answer would be. It'd be freedom or bread or a job. No. It was the following. Our fundamental problem in Egypt is that we have an over-concentration of authority in the executive branch. What we need is a new constitutional system that will, make, that will strengthen a parliament and make power truly accountable to the people. But, whoa. One of your former students. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no. No. One of my teachers, I thought, okay, you know, I thought, okay this, is, this, is, this, is not, this is not a revolution. This is revenge of the nerds. Um, <laughs> um, and there was a sense. Now, you look at it two years later. Were they right? Well, what, in a sense, they did revive politics. It is impossible to go to Egypt today and ask a question about the weather without getting into a political discussion. Well, weather would be better if the Muslim Brotherhood weren't in charge, you know, this sort of thing. Um, um, and, and, and so politics has been reborn in that sense. People organize, people contest, people argue, people discuss. But there is a strong sense of disappointment as well. We're not getting the politics right. What are the problems? And I want to talk about these very, very briefly. Um, the number one problem, that, my guess is if you called a, 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 a political scientist in, um, they would say, uh, and lots have been called in, um, you got the process wrong, right? If you were to have sat down, got a committee political scientist together to design a transition process, they would have designed something that looked on paper an awful lot like the Tunisian process. Okay. What was interesting was I went to Tunisia a couple times since the revolution. Any time that I had a discussion in Tunisia, why is it that you're doing it this way? They would say, they would talk in historical terms. Well, this is the way we did it back in the 1950s, but here's what went wrong. It was a remarkable thing because in, in Tunisia, in the, I mean, what they were talking about was a constitutional process. When they got independence from France, they had a constitutional process. And the constitutional process was dominated by a party that called itself the Constitution Party. So you would think that Tunisians would wake up in 2011 and 2012 and 2013 and say, Constitution, we've heard that talk before. But instead, what they were saying, let's go back to independence and do it right, do it over again, do it right. So they, did, they designed what was really in, in, in a model process. The Egyptians did everything wrong, okay? I would virtually guarantee that anytime you go anywhere in the world today and you do a country that's writing a constitution, you'll run into somebody from South Africa. South Africa has a model process. I would virtually guarantee, and I apologize to any Egyptians who get offended by this, you will never run into an Egyptian consultant who say, hi, I'm here from Cairo and I'm here to help you design your constitutional process. They did everything wrong. And the reason they did everything wrong, in retrospect, people are saying, oh, the, 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 the army tried to shove this through, the, the, the brotherhood tried to... Uh, I shove this through. My sense was that they had very little sense how to do this from the beginning because in a sense they had never done, they'd written constitutions before, they had never done so through a political process. 
So they, they made some actual bad decisions about how to do it later on. And so the process went off the rails, not because the Brotherhood dominated it, not because the opposition was operating in bad faith. The Brotherhood did dominate it and the opposition did operate in bad faith, but because it was something that was fundamentally, there was a fundamental set of incentives structured into the process that kind of made them do it. So that was something that went wrong. The remarkable thing is that constitu- if, you read, if you took a bunch of Egyptians and read them, put them in a room, from various perspectives, they would have produced a document that looked 90% like the document that came out. But the process was one that hardened divisions very much um, and, that, and that made people feel embittered. Even the victors felt, felt embittered. So that was the first problem, constitutional process. Second problem is related to that, deep polarization in Egyptian political life in a way that, I mean, we're here in the state of Virginia. You know what it's like to, to be in a swing state the days before a presidential election and what that does to political rhetoric. Well, Egypt is, an, is permanently a swing state days before an American presidential election. Um, You're hearing shrill rhetoric, accusations, irresponsible talk from both sides, and camps that do not know how to talk to each other and can only hear the shrillest voices from the other side. So you've got a very deeply polarized process. A third problem is that you've got, Egypt is a state of very, very strong institutions. Those institutions have historically been dominated, at least since the 1950s, by the presidency. There's now a much weaker presidency keeping control of them, but they're still dominated by the same personnel. So they're having to adjust themselves, and some, some adjust themselves far too quickly. Oh, it was Mubarak, now it's Morsi. What do, we, what, what do we do to serve Morsi? And some are extremely resistant. There's talk in Egypt about kind of the deep state. My sense is that the Egyptian state is not all that deep, but it's very, very wide. It's everywhere in society. And, and in a sense, this is a bureaucracy that, it, that, that insinuates itself in every single aspect of the country that is having trouble adjusting itself to this transition. And the final problem, and this is, this is the most disturbing thing actually for me, is political violence. Egypt was a place where even when people talked a lot about politics, they never hurt each other, okay? And that was in many ways, in 2011 and 2012, Egypt saving grace. I don't want to say that nobody hurt each other. There were casualties in this revolution and after the revolution. But it was a place where violence still deeply shocked people, where the minute violence was deployed, the party that deployed it paid a very high political price for having done so. So, and, and, and I see that I see that beginning to, to be nibbled away at. I see violence being deployed in political disputes in a way that I find deeply troubling. Um, it, is still not, uh, it is still not Syria, it is still not Iraq by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a place where people will sometimes resort to direct action and even using violence in their opponents in a way that w- would have been unthinkable a couple years ago. So that's kind of a, a, a grim picture. Um, at the same time, and here I'll come back to... Um, uh, uh, Bill Kwan's wisdom about kind of being a little bit patient and, 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 and Libby status as a historian who wants probably to take the long view and remind us that countries can get constitutional processes wrong all the time and still do fine. Two quick examples. France has, two, has had two long-lived constitutions. One was in 1871 when the country was so ideologically divided they said let's just kind of write, write out a few sets of rules we won't do this full constitution, and we'll just get politics going. And it survived until the Second World War. 1958, de Gaulle rams through a constitution, over, the, over you know, basically rams it down the left's throat, and it can survive socialist precedents just fine. So, so there are ways in which, when politics starts going again, it can work itself. The second example, just very briefly, Federal Republic of Germany. Has, a, has had the same basic law since 1949. It doesn't call itself a constitution be, for political reasons having to do with the way and the circumstances under which it was written. The people who wrote it didn't want to call it a constitution, looked upon it as an interim document. It lasted, it has lasted since 1949. The Weimar Constitution, one of the most carefully designed documents in the history of the world, resulted in, or basically uh, collapsed in, uh, under Nazi assault. So, so getting the Constitution right doesn't necessarily uh, um, get you everything. My sense is that there is still a very strong possibility for the Egyptian Revolution. The point to watch, or the, the, the critical point to watch, um, is whether or not op- government and opposition or various political forces learn to find a way 
to talk about their differences, to manage their differences, to find ways to resolve some matters and decide the bounds of political mm-hmm. competition for those matters that they can't resolve. That when they learn to accept the results, when an opposition party that loses an election reacts by saying, okay, how do we win the next one? Um, and that's what's, that's what's missing in Egypt to date. I don't think there, that all hope is lost for it, for it developing, but that's something that, that's the, the, the kind of set of expectations that I think would develop over five to ten years, not over two years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan. Um, <laughs> and now we have Nishi Ayashi, uh, who is the founder and president of the Maghreb Center in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello to everyone. Uh, what happened to the Arab Spring? Well, for the time being, it seems that it has taken an Islamist turn. From Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya, and North Africa, where the autocratic regimes in place have been toppled by unorganized and little youth movements without any particular political affiliation, rapidly joined by uh, labor organizations, human and uh, and women's rights groups, democracy advocates, etc., to Syria and Bahrain in the Middle East, Islamists are now taking the center stage. In North Africa, more specifically in the Maghreb, which is, as you all know, uh, includes all the countries of the region except Egypt. <laughs> That's the Maghreb, historically. Um, so uh, mm-hmm. l- l- I would present you with an overview of, of the region very b- briefly and focus it most essentially on Morocco but and Tunisia, mostly Tunisia. Uh, let's start with Libya. Mm-hmm. And um, in Libya, the p- political orientation, uh, its political orientation is still unclear. We, d- we don't really know what's going on there where the central government is very weak. There are about 140 tribes. So it's a divided society along tribal lines, mostly. There are dozens, still dozens of armed militias at around, I mean, so uh, after the Islamist movement have n- haven't been particularly present in, in Libya. They have been uh, uh, suppressed by Gaddafi harshly. So the uh, Islamist influence was rather, at least openly, rather, rather reduced. Um, but since then it is gaining ground over there. However, it seems to be a rather moderate version of Islamism for now. Uh, bef- um, Algeria, briefly. Algeria is a space, space, special case. No Arab Spring per se took place in Algeria, and there are many reasons about that. I'm sure you've heard of a few of them. If you talk to Algerians, they will tell you, well, we had our Arab Spring in, in the 90s when we had free and election and relatively fair, and we elected this, the Islamists, the Islamist party, the uh, FIS, according uh, for Islamis du Salufis, according to his French acronym. And then uh, the, uh, to get to those elections, of course, the people had to take it to the streets. And, and eventually then uh, the elections took place. People elected the Islamists. The military stepped in and canceled the elections, which triggered a, an awful civil war yeah, that, that lasted for some 10 years. And people talk of uh, 150,000 to 200,000 deaths. So uh, that has prevented uh, uh, the Algerian people from from following the Arab Spring trend of, of uh, you know demonstrations and and so on and so forth. Uh, apparently, and uh, there's another another reason also. The the government has co-opted the Islamists in Algeria. They they've succeeded in including them into the political process uh, to the point where uh, they've been even part of government, government uh, governing coalitions. And uh, recently, w- w- they had elections in Algeria in May 2012, and they saw Islamist uh, parties performing poorly. So people are not in Algeria less and less interested. It's interesting to, to uh, by the uh, by voting Islamists for the Islamists. The Islamists are not. C- Regarded anymore as the uh, the solution, so to speak, to uh, to all the uh, the problems of Algeria, which are the same as elsewhere in the region. Uh, um, I mean, the economy performs very poorly. The, there's a lot of unemployment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
However, in the case of Algeria, there is oil and gas, and the government is able to buy social peace, which played a little, some kind of a role there in preventing the Arab Spring from occurring. And as uh, Professor Quandet pointed out, the government uh, also paid and increased the salaries of the civil service in order to keep them quiet as well. So uh, then I guess uh, for the time being, Algeria is, is relatively quiet. Uh, the mm -hmm. Islamists are playing by the rules of the game. They've been, um, they even performed very poorly. And there is no secular opposition per se that is able to, to mobilize a substantial electorate around some of its uh, uh, apolitical program, let's say, or some political uh, yeah, orientations. Um, Morocco. Morocco um, has pursued meaningful political reform that seem to be moving the kingdom gradually to mo toward more representative government and without an Arab Spring, without the way I, I understand it is uh, <coughs> without major upheavals and, and uh, uprising, social and et cetera. And these reforms have been initiated prior to the Arab Spring, uh, indeed, at the instigation of the king himself, Mohammed VI, who um, reform, I mean, uh, reformed the constitution, but the constitution process there was 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 done uh, the, by by experts, and then presented to the people to, for for vote. And different process than elsewhere, than Egypt and Tunisia. Um, and after that, they had elections, and an Islamist party won like, I mean, a slight majority, uh, a tenuous foothold in power, and uh, its uh, its name is the PGT, the uh, Party for Justice and Development. Um, it, it, it has a slight majority, so it has to, to govern with a, with a coalition of uh, that includes uh, even former communists or and liberals and and, and pro royalist uh, parties. The king keeps um, keeps a, a lot of power, so to speak. I mean, he can name uh, forty strategic positions. Uh, he essentially he, he keeps the upper hand on foreign policy intelligence and military matters. But he seems to be, he and the Islamists seems to be working relatively well together. Uh, the Islamists are not, for the, have, have not been asking for too much. They, uh, the, they're playing along with the king and, um, and they're not really challenging the system. Uh, the, 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 the problem in, is in Morocco is also economic. It's even worse than in Algeria, to a certain extent. They don't have oil and gas to buy social peace. And, um, and it needs uh, reform tremendously. And uh, the, the country is also uh, eaten by corruption. It's, uh, the economy has suffered a lot from corruption. Uh, the Islamists have tried to tackle, to combat corruption, but it's, it's a long process. And, uh, and they probably don't, are not using the tools for that, the proper tools for that but um, so the issue in Morocco will be will truly be economic in my view now Tunisia uh, Tunisia as you you know the uh, I allegedly moderate Islamist party uh, won uh, the October October 2011 constituent assembly elections so they elected the Tunisian people Tunisian people elected a, 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 a an assembly uh, to to uh, draft a new constitution and and, um, and appoint an interim government until new elections in in next summer. Uh, in this case as well, the Islamist party, which is called an Nada, won and uh, didn't win an absolute majority. So it has to govern with two other smaller centre-left secular parties. Uh, so then the, uh, the constitutional process, indeed Tunisia has a history of, of, of writing constitutions. The first one was uh, even uh, what was uh, discussed I mean, and, and, and written 1832, before the French invasion, 1832, when, uh, um, and then again in 1956 when the French left Tunisia, the French were the former colonial power. And already in 1956 the debate was between between the conservatives, they were not Islamists then. They were conservative and religious people, rather the people who were more traditional, more conservative in their approach. Uh, 
and the modernists uh, led by former President Bourguiba. Uh, today, the, 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 the Constitution debate is about, uh, Anada is, has accepted that Sharia, religious law, doesn't become the source of legislation. They said, it's okay, we want to have it in the Constitution, that's fine. But then that doesn't prevent them. Each time there is a, something to discuss, to, to question, for example, Tunisia has, uh, has and, and the, the previous regime has signed several international, international uh, uh, agreements, such as the, the agreement on human rights, and inc that includes women's rights, etc. So the NAD is now discussing women's rights issues within that context. They, they, don't, they don't criticize, they don't uh, upfront. I would say they don't. They they always find a way to. It's a draft. The drafting process is 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 uh, dragging on. Thanks to them. Also, they they always find a way not to move it ahead and and, and not to uh, to accept what the secular parties are pro proposing, including in terms of women rights. So now women. They want women, for example, to be not equal to men but complementary. That's the new the new way of saying things. Oh. Uh, okay, Anada seems to, well, um, I wanted to say a word about Anada is, has also been presented as an adept of the Turkish model. What we tend to forget, I mean, many people tend to forget in the case of, of Turkey, you have the military who are guarding the playing field. The military are drawing red lines, but, and you don't have that in Tunisia, there are no military. The only, uh, uh, those who are keeping the Islamists at bay, in many ways, are civil society organizations, women's groups, and others. And, and that's what make, makes Tunisia a very interesting case. You don't have any military there, you don't have any... It's really civil society organizations, and to a certain extent pressure from foreign powers, Europe, mostly France, and, and the <coughs> United States. Uh, and, and that's it. Uh, and that itself is divided in, in a two wings, two trans, a rather very conservative and violent one, and the more moderate one. Of course, Rec they uh, they they seem, according to many Tunisians, seem to play together, hand in hand. Uh, the the the, the uh, Islamist power didn't uh, limit or the uh, the um, the Salafist, the famous conservative wing. Uh, Tunisia now is inundated by by uh, by preachers from the middle, from from Kuwait and from the Middle East, people, Salafi preachers that go around preaching. Uh, jihad Islam uh, to these young people without jobs, without any prospect in life, in rural life, with little education, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and that is done under the eye of the Islamist authority, the Anad authority. And the Islamists have been aggressing university professors, they've been aggressing women, they've been aggressing, uh, assaulting women, university professors, <laughs> artists, et cetera. Um, and that has, and, and, and without being bothered, practically. I mean, the, some of them have been arrested for one or two days and then uh, released. So that has created a climate that favored the recent killing of a ma major main political opponent to, 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 to another. It was, this is the first killing, political kill assassination in Tunisia. Tunisia doesn't have a history of political assassination. I mean, there maybe a few when the Tunisians were fighting the French in the 50s and uh, the French the French colonial power for their independence, but no, nothing of the sort happened. So that was really shocking to many Tunisians and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and that's where we are today. I mean, we are in a situation where we don't know where we're going. Uh, there's a lot of uh, concern on, on the part of Tunisians, but I believe that uh, in spite of that, the process went rather I wouldn't say smoothly, but okay, the transition. And, uh, and uh, Tunisians are proud of their peaceful past, and they, I hope that uh, they will keep uh, uh, abiding by it Thank for now. Nice. Okay, me too. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you so much. Abdelhadi Jadallah of George Mason University and President of Common Denominator. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. May I go up first? Sure. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Can you hear me? 
Okay. As we gather today in this prestigious institution, events continue to unfold in the Arab world. My colleagues covered most of them, but I'd like to touch upon them from a conflict resolution perspective as uh, my whole, uh, I think of myself as a practitioner and scholar in that field. And the Arab world has been impacted uh, seriously by the escalation of events, uh, the Arab Spring or Arab Awakening, as uh, Ambassador mentioned. But it's trying to really understand, I think, the region, its core identity, its historical image, and how it's influencing the future relationship uh, it has with the rest of the world. But while these reactions are happening and spreading throughout the world, responses have really varied from humanitarian aid to mitigate the suffering of children, men, and women, to the settlement of scores with despotic regimes uh, like uh, my colleagues have kindly spoken to. Concurrently, the people of the region are requesting change that meets their needs and fulfills their aspirations for systems that respect their rights and uh, freedoms in all aspects of daily life. They're also resorting mostly to peaceful and occasionally violent means, hoping to be heard and understood. And one can easily argue, I think you will agree with me, that their grievances are very deep, also legitimate, and that they need to be addressed. Equally to these uh, important developments is the ongoing involvement of what is often referred to as third party. These third parties are engaging in the constantly changing landscape of the Arab, Arab world. Many are attempting to influence, to facilitate, or mediate its conversation with itself, its neighbors, and the international community at large. Important, again, to these interventions is the way they are being formed, shaped, and the way they impact the dynamics on the ongoing conflicts and developments. But perhaps it's important I define what I mean by third parties, which is really the focus of my presentation. And my understanding from my research and doctoral work, it's really we mean any entity. It could be a state or the world community, institutions, multilateral organizations, civil society, individuals, grassroots influentials, professional experts, and all of them are trying to respond to these critical develop, uh, developments, uh, sometimes by invitation or maybe motivated by their own <coughs> interests, values, and beliefs. Both are hoping to influence and impact the outcomes of this wave of social institutional change that we are witnessing. Since time of, is of essence in my presentation, I hope I get 12 minutes since I'm last. My hope is that I bring to your attention some of the core concepts associated with third party roles through the lens of a conflict resolution practitioner like myself, list challenges and dilemmas associated with that role, and end perhaps with some important <laughs> considerations for their ongoing involvement and our evaluation of their engagement in the Arab world as they continue to respond to these critical events, especially in the face of many of the issues that have been mentioned, but especially terrorism, large-scale uh, large violence, and social unrest. We've also observed, and I did too, that in response to these ongoing developments in need, third parties have been mitigating activities and leveraging processes, which is a very important point, and I think uh, uh, my colleagues have referred to them, such as dialogue, facilitation, and all with the intention, or at least with the goal, of a peaceful resolution of local and national and politically charged conflicts. So what does research tell us on, from practice, particularly, about this part of uh, engagement from third party roles? We understand that they are faced with limitations of existing processes and models. We also know that third parties uh, are revisiting their working assumptions on key concepts like neutrality, which is very much in the language of international relations, and uh, many of us are aware of that. It's also confirming for us the importance of contextual analysis of a problem or a dispute or even any community uh, escalation. And also the importance of the cultural fluency, and I underscore that, and competencies of these third parties in places where they work, and the need to understand and work with trauma, acknowledging its impact on the party's ability to reach resolution. Very important factor now, uh, we're partnering with a lot of mental health practitioners to really understand how we could resolve conflict uh, and an understanding with trauma. 
Additional research also indicated the limitations of short-term short responses in addressing the root causes of terrorism and large-scale violence, as I mentioned earlier, and also mediating and negotiating value-based conflicts dealing with religious fundamentalism, which was covered by some of my colleagues. There is also the realization that there is a need for different kinds of partnerships. We've seen this with many state actors. Uh, no time to mention them in details, maybe in the, the question and answer period. And also the lack of coordinated efforts. Everybody is coming in trying to address the Arab awakening or the Arab spring or the Arab autumn if you, you want to use even a third termination. And so it presents us really that we need to think of some important questions as we think about third party roles. And I formulated a few that I hope we can maybe address la later. One of them I think is what is the ideal profile of an intervener, if any, or interveners, and what role can they play in the midst of such unrest and institu institutional changes? What processes or group of processes are best suited to deal with this changing landscape, and especially communal, sectarian, and religious violence? Can existing processes that we know from the field of conflict resolution, such as mediation, facilitation, negotiated agreements, etc., address the complex nature of this large-scale change? We're constantly, you mentioned, Mr. Ambassador, uh, having transforming and transporting some of these models. Can it deal with the humanitarian crises of this, the, the current state we're seeing in Syria? 60,000, I believe, is the last number. Of course, uh, it could be more, or 70,000. Can it address popular uprisings and support the aspirations of the people without doing harm? And that's really a very important thing. It lends an ethical uh, consideration. How can we as interveners, or how can they as interveners or third parties, support the inclusion of civil society, which was mentioned, especially at, as it relates to women's issues and youth, and where and how in the process will their voice and inclusion be heard? How do existing processes manage the influence and actions and interests of regional players and the international community? More importantly, how can we ensure the translation, adaptation, and transfer of Western processes and other conflict resolution tools that are culturally sensitized to the local context? How can we prepare for the role of religion in supporting potential solutions given the rise of Islamists and the emphasis and manifestations of religious identities in the region? How can we build and leverage the positive influence, if any, of religious values? How can we influence religious extremist rhetoric, which you mentioned a very uh, important example that happened yesterday or two days ago? How are other religious traditions accommodated, uh, especially in Egypt, we're seeing that discourse and allowed to contribute to such a process? But this is really one way of thinking about it, is posing these questions. But we can also look at four dimensions of intervention that I'll cover briefly and hopefully stay within my time limits. And these are around uh, four, four kinds of dimensions when we think of uh, conflict resolution or third party roles. And these are related to uh, challenges that these third party roles will have to deal with. One is related to issues. How to deal with such a significant number of issues, youth, violence, change, constitutional reform. You mentioned, I mean, autocratic rule, perceptions of corruption, uh, Professor Quant looked at it, social mobility of Arab youth, unemployment, and the list goes on and on, and maybe underscore armed civilians, the availability of small arms uh, through illicit trade, violence, non-state actors. Um, I think you would agree with me, we can map this out and maybe full, uh, fill a couple of charts. Not only are they there and persistent, but they're complicated, and when solutions have been attempted, they're not very successful. We need to be modest, as you had mentioned. We also have challenges related to the parties. We're dealing with a large number of parties, often diverse and with competing needs and goals. Some parties also suffer from internal conflicts, and that's really some of the symptoms we are all aware of. We can't treat them as one. We may ha they may have a title, but we, beneath that title, there might be a lot of diversity in opinion. 
They're all competing to come to the table, have their voices heard, and also labeling one another uh, with, uh, t for the sake of exclusion, each excluding each other. They call each other fundamentalist, extremist, irrational, uh, irrelevant, and the list goes on. And then there are challenges related to context, uh, and that really we have to think about. The context meaning where is the economic and human resources are going? Uh, where are the parties vested and why are they vested in continuing the conflict? And also how powerful parties are dominating and dictating the interest, their interest in working around that. And then finally on process, we need to really think about power asymmetry and what to do about that. So I'll end very quickly and uh, to say that maybe what we need to think about when we think about third parties is that we need processes that are inclusive, legitimate in the eyes of the people, that are fair, that address grievances and deep-rooted issues, and more importantly, promote reconciliation, relationships between the people. We also need to uh, factor in the collective and individual traumas. And we also need to think how are we gonna, uh, how these third parties are gonna bring together historically marginalized groups and deal with the power asymmetry that I mentioned. I end by a few recommendations. I'll go through them very quickly since I have uh, very little time. We need to really think of how to convene a diverse group of experts and an interdisciplinary approach uh, to, help, uh, to help address and deal with the issues happening in the Arab world. We re really need to rethink and redo the, prince, uh, the pretense of neutrality and rethink impartiality. We also need to think about system-wide interventions where the intervener is not just on the outside of the equation but part of the equation. We also need to understand the third party and the intervener's position on issues of justice and fairness. And then I end really with thinking, uh, saying that um, it's very important that um, we respond with authenticity as third parties. We need to remember the ethical dimensions and the impact of our actions on the people that we are either trying to help or pretending to help. Perhaps we can think of ourselves as individuals gifted with big ears so we listen to understand, wide eyes to see through a wider lens, a big heart so we can feel the pain and emotions that are being expressed and finally, equip ourselves with a toolkit that is culturally sensitive and that can be tailored in partnership with those directly impacted by the unfolding events. I believe uh, from my own practice, it is only when and if we gain everyone's trust that we are able to support changes that the people are advocating for, not the changes that we think they should be making. <laughs> to this conversation about the uh, Arab Spring, uh, what has happened with it, where it's going. I open the floor to your questions. Yesterday, the Washington Post reported that Iran is sending in uh, groups to either support Assad or to be there when Assad falls. Can anyone comment on that? <laughs> well, you see, this is part of uh, the ethnic and religious clustering that is taking place in the region. Iran has um, has had uh, taken a position from day one and it's not new information that they are sending uh, uh, whatever you know troops to to, to Syria um, the thing there again um, it's about uh, two axes that are formulating in the region you have Iran and Syria and Iran is using Syria as a link with its Hezbollah in Lebanon and on the other end, of course, you have, of course, you know, with this uh, uh, camp, you have, for different reasons, China and Russia. But also on the other uh, end, you have uh, 
the West, uh, the US, the EU, Qatar, um, uh, and possibly the Muslim Brotherhood front uh, in Egypt and in other countries leading to Hamas. So you have two groupings now uh, directing their efforts uh, on, on that country. But having said this, the main point that I did mention at the beginning is that for me, in my mind, I don't see any future for the regime of Bashar al-Assad. At least from a human rights uh, perspective, legal perspective, the diplomatic perspective, this regime is over. Now, the thing is also that we will be committing a sin or a major mistake also if we allow you know, Iran or whoever to try to divide that country on the basis of sectarian, Alawite and Sunni and Shia. I think that this will pose a major threat to the region, to the global security, also to the European security. And of course, it will touch, you know, uh, deeply countries like Jordan and country like, uh, like uh, Turkey. It's not new that Iran is there, but at the end of the day, even if they have their troops or whatever, you know, uh, uh, they are doing, they are defending their final tie with their fellow group in Lebanon, and that is Hezbollah. Do other of you agree yeah, that like the regime is over? Possibly. I would like to, um, I think the, um, the question about Iran is an important one, but I would like to build on it and, and use it to, to talk about foreign interventions in the course of the so-called Arab Spring and the transition democratic process there. Uh, of course, Iran is trying to manipulate the situation, but uh, they are not the only ones who are doing, doing that. I would like to mention, because it's rarely <laughs> mentioned, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Uh, apparently, uh, Qatar has has uh, chosen to support the Islamists everywhere in the Arab Muslim world, including in Tunisia, Libya, uh, e Egypt, uh, as well as there seems it's it seems that there is a division of labor between Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is is supporting the Salafists, the more conservative elements, the more radical even elements of uh, political Islam, and uh, and Qatar is helping, uh, subsidizing even uh, the, the, m the softer, the more moderate Islamists. At least in the case of Tunisia and Egypt, they, 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 with Qatari money, they, they can buy votes. They did. Uh, and so on and so forth. And they do benefit from the support of, the, of, of Qatar, which is Qatar is in favor of the spread of a fundamentalist lecture, so to speak, of Islam as well. And uh, so there are, there are foreign interventions <laughs> in the course of the Arab Spring. I wanted to point that out. It doesn't mean that the U.S. is not present either. <laughs> but it's another debate. Well, it's <coughs> I don't think we're going to see uh, a single model for all of the countries in the Arab world. I think we will see uh, some real horror stories. We're seeing it in Syria now. 
And um, I won't try to predict how that's going to go, but I don't think there's a quick, clean resolution in sight. So maybe we will see <clears throat> decade-long uh, turmoil and violence and uh, whatever replaces the Assad regime may not look a lot nicer than what it replaced. So I think that's the one that worries me most in terms of your, your, your horrible examples. Uh, Tunisia and Egypt strike me as less prone to that, partly because there's less of a sectarian um, divide, virtually none in Tunisia and not a major one in Egypt. And I, I think we can see that sectarianism can make these problems much worse. In Iraq, it, it was a major issue. In Lebanon, it, it became the defining issue in their civil war, which, remember, went on for 15 years and cost the Lebanese people something on the order of five or six percent of their population was killed or uh, badly injured, which is a huge percentage in these kind of conflicts. Uh, so there are some very bad things that can come out of this, but I don't think there's a single model. I think we're going to see a lot of uh, variety. We're going to see some reform efforts that may actually succeed in preventing uh, these kinds of uh, terrible outcomes. But I worry a lot about the countries that go through um, a, a, a deep and prolonged period of violence. Iraq, uh, Syria, if it starts up again in Lebanon, I think it could uh, once again uh, be very hard to stop. Um, and, and I don't know enough about Yemen to speak intelligently about it, but Yemen has been bogged down in internal uh, conflict near civil war, and it doesn't strike me that the revolution has brought that prospect yet to an end. So the prospect of violence worries me more than the new strong you know, Nazi-style state or Mussolini-style state or Robespierre. Um, in, in fact, it's the, the inability to rebuild state structures that have any kind of authority that right now is worrisome. Uh, you know, you, you, you see what happens when a country falls apart. Libya, uh, Iraq, after we deposed uh, Saddam Hussein, the, the, the anarchy phase can be uh, as threatening to people's lives as the dictatorial phase can be. And, and on, on this point in particular that the professor mentioned, um, indeed the anocracy is a phase where the country um, presents itself uh, in a way or another at the face as a democratic country or moving to democracy. But then because it has not been accustomed with this in a transitional period, you will have lots of loopholes in the system if you dig deeper. And this is why exactly I concur with the professor that you will be very worried about issues relating to human rights, women rights, meaningful reforms, and freedoms. And let's take, for example, three, three models here, if I may say. And this is worrying in the region. Egypt, for instance. Now, the country with, with the, the distinguished panelists mentioned, you know, that they went through the phase of writing a constitution, they had a political process, they did not get it right. There are many reasons for that, but anyway, now you have an elected president for the first time in the biggest country or in the Arab world. He is elected. But then when you see how the president is acting, he's not acting as a president for the nation. He's acting as a president for one group. And actually, he's bringing all his people to the power or to the office. And to my knowledge, that he initiated cases or claims against reporters and media anchors much more than what Hosni Mubarak did, because they are sort of accusing him or reporting him in the media. There has been lots of arrests. There has been lots of violations in terms of human rights. Now, this is an elected president, and that they are presenting a model of democracy. Take the example of Iraq, for instance. We have an elected prime minister, Mr. Al-Maliki. However, the country is bogged down in 
uh, ethnic and religious uh, uh, clustering. And, and there is, I mean, the, the, you, you barely can talk about human rights in that country. You have another model, Jordan. Although it's not mentioned a lot, we did not have any meaningful political reform there. And there has been lots of arrests by the security for those who are calling for reform in the country or actually accusing the king himself of certain aspects. So this kind of model is very critical. Now, I think that this is a phase and that what we need to focus on is not just reaching democracy, but we want to reach liberal democracy. Because it has not been part of the Arab system to have democracy other than the concept of al-Shura that we have or had. And that existed probably 1400 years ago and ended with the Prophet Muhammad. But from my personal experience, I believe the human values are the same. People want to rule themselves by themselves, regardless of the model. I mean, democracy, I mean, the American democracy, not necessarily is a British one, not necessarily the Jordanian one or the Moroccan one. But at the end of the day, you're talking about pluralism and freedoms and possibly liberal structures whereby you have NGOs, you have other interveners or powers that check on or make a balance on the power of the system itself. If we manage to reach that stage, I think that we will be able to move on. But let, I mean, let no one have any illusions. This is a long process in the Arab world. It's not going to happen in the coming two years. Possibly it's going to take 10 years or a decade. And for me, as a liberal person, if I, if I may say, I would like the Islamic project to be in power because I would like it also to be stripped does it have any economic or social programs? Let them be in power, provided, of course, that what I said at the beginning, that we don't end up with another authoritarian regime. We want to end you know, all the autocracies that we have in the Arab world. We want to end the rentier state fashion that was created by the leaders of the Arab world, but not you know, to go into another Islamic authoritarian re regime. I don't see that w we, we will end up, you know, in a model like what happened in Europe, but of course this could happen. But I think that the international community is different now, and you have lots of checks and balances that can be uh, played by the United State or, uh, States or the EU, whereby they can rectify, although, I mean, they have some power, they can rectify the process. And for instance, remember when Morsi uh, has, has taken, you know, c the Constitution constitutional declaration, the U.S. and the international community really flagged some cards there and he had to step back. I see that there are some international checks and balances in the system today. Uh, thank you. Is, uh, are there any other pan panelists that might want to comment on, I think we're, we're seeing a trend or a, a sort of maybe a conversation emerging here on the efficacy or not of intervention. Um, is it, you know, are these processes that um, have been spoiled by outside intervention, or can you know what does it take to um, have a, a, a more productive one? And yeah. maybe um, I just Dr. like, uh, would like to speak. thank you. I just like to say that also uh, institutions like the United Nations is really thinking seriously of its role uh, in regard to how to manage for all of this because uh, they are perhaps well positioned to do so. So for example, you have the Bureau of Crisis Intervention in New York, and I'm doing some work with them now. We're trying to look about uh, through a concept that has worked for South Africa, which is one of the insider mediator. And the insider mediator, by definition, is someone who has credibility within, uh, within a community or a system. And so when you um, empower them and you work with them and give them a capacity or you participate with them in partnership, you could actually build the capacity from within, not just from the outside helping. So And so there are many conversations that are happening that I'd like to, to share, not in too much detail, because a lot of conferences are being put together to actually engage in dialogue around what that might look like. Also, you have uh, other interveners who are using words like there are doers and enablers. And I interviewed one of them uh, who is quite prominent doing work in Tunisia. And I like this terminology in a sense. He said there are many situations in these societies where people are just jumping in 
and really putting their weight in, in, in the community without being asked. And they are acting to facilitate some sort of problem solving to some of these issues that are happening on day-to-day -day basis that you and I cannot even put our hands around them because of various reasons, cultural sensitivity, being on the periphery, not being accepted. And so uh, to him, he thinks that there are the enablers, and the enablers might be the civil society, international institutions, academics, uh, like uh, many of uh, those present in the room, et cetera, that could be leveraged actually in partnership with them to resolve. So it's a big question. A lot of people are thinking about it, and uh, it's not easy to answer, especially uh, whether you're accepted or not. And I hope that's really the message that I was trying to, to put through. It's, um, are you invited? Or are you, uh, how are you will be perceived, uh, especially the historical relationships with the West? And also uh, the agendas, the interests, and the positions that many people are taking. So all these factors have to be uh, managed. Thank you. Okay. Um, specifically mentioned the lack of influence of that Americans have had and I was wondering what role if any um, you panelists see for the American government moving forward I, I think we're suffering from intervention fatigue now in the United States uh, if after spending a trillion dollars and 5,000 American lives and hundreds of thousands of Iraqi lives, we couldn't design a better outcome than the one we've got in Iraq. It makes me wonder what kind of American intervention could work. Um, money is usually not the problem in these societies. There's lots of money around. So yes, we could provide economic aid, humanitarian aid, but so can lots of other people. Um, Military intervention seems to not work. It has a real counterproductive uh, parts to it. And quite frankly, I'm appalled at the degree of ignorance that our policymakers uh, have when it comes to understanding these societies. When we intervened in Iraq, I can tell you from firsthand information, the President of the United States did not know the difference between Sunnis and Shis in that country. Uh, that worries me. And how much more do we know about a place like Syria, to say nothing of Yemen or Libya and so forth? So I think we as Americans have to be very um, aware that we have gone down the road of intervention in two Middle East, South Asian societies on a very large scale, Afghanistan being the other. And it's very likely that when we step back and look at the net results, we will not have much more to show for our intervention than the Russians had to show for their intervention in Afghanistan. Uh, the kind of raw power we can deploy gets certain kinds of results. You topple regimes. Putting a regime back together, putting a state back together, is a totally different and much more complicated uh, exercise, and we're not well suited for it. Can, can I weigh in if I can on... Um I think you're absolutely right with kind of the big interventions. Um, and um, it will probably be a long time, mercifully, before the United States tries a massive engineering project like it tried in uh, Iraq. There are other cases in the region. Um, and I would actually apply, you know, ones where you have intact states that are uh, undergoing some kind of transformation, Tunisia and, and, and Egypt being the leading example. I would apply your same lesson even to those states. I mean, you, when, when you spoke, you talked about uh, the United States not having much ability to uh, affect um, Egypt. And I think that's basically right, that what, is, what these societies are going through an incredibly inward looking moment um, and their the politics that is on people's mind is purely domestic um, 
But on this score, I would actually be a little bit gentler on the American leadership right now. My, my line about the Bush administration was they didn't know what they were doing, but they did it anyway. Uh, this administration knows what it's doing. It's just not doing anything. Um, and I think that's good, actually, and especially in the cases that I'm, that I'm talking about. There was some understanding that sunk in. I mean, you heard it like a mantra um, in January and February. This is not about us. Um, um, and, um, and, and there was some realization that I think sunk in that these countries had domestic political processes um, that um, and, and, and essentially a decision was made, I think, at least in the Egyptian case, that said this is a this is a political process that is going to go ahead. There are certain things we can hold on to probably if we really concentrate on them. We might be able to rescue the Egyptian Israeli peace treaty. And the United States did. That treaty is still intact. I mean, there's a, it's, it's a problematic relationship, to be sure, but that treaty is still intact. Um, we're not going to be able to micromanage the uh, transition process, and we understand that this is a transition process that might throw up Islamists in pol- political power. If you had told me, uh, if you had asked me a couple or three years ago, will the United States be able to cope with a Muslim Brotherhood leadership in Egypt? Oh, and will the Muslim Brotherhood be able to cope with an Egypt that is still tied with a fairly direct, a fairly tight relationship with the United States? I would have said, I doubt it. And both sides have accommodated each other. So in a sense, I think I'm not, you know, wh- whatever our views of, 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 of Islamist leadership is, um, my sense is that the United States has adjusted fairly well by basically being very modest in what it was trying to accomplish. Can I make a brief comment? I may. I, I've been to the region frequently, and I've facilitated the um, sectarian dialogue. I've I've worked in peace building. I've trained people there. I've, uh, you know, done assessments and so on. Uh, I cannot uh, describe to you the um, anti-American sentiment and the anger that people have, but it's also a very interesting relationship, and it will uh, change the way we think of doing our work there. Uh, because really of the lack of receptivity. Uh, You have to be the vehicles by which you are invited or uh, how you're going, who's engaging your work, your own credibility as you're doing work in the region is very much into question. And so even with the initiatives that I'm working on, there is a lot of discussion, even how we're writing the letters of invitation. Are we asking people their opinion to come and listen to us or are they asking uh, asking their opinion? Or are we presenting them with ideas? And there's a lot of humbleness now. People are saying, no, we're going to convene to listen. Rather, we're going to go there and dictate, uh, do it our way, here is our model, and this is best practice, et cetera, et cetera. So from from the work that I have done and my recent visits to the region, I think uh, there is a shift uh, in attitude over there towards American intervention even represented by people like us who are of Arab-American descent. I mean, they question us. They ask us, who's paying you? Uh, Why are you here? Why do you think you can do this work? Uh, Truly, we go through a couple of days where until we build trust, it takes a bit of time. So I think the implications are going to be huge for us, uh, given our attitudes and uh, the the way we have uh, designed our interventions in the region. I would like to add something uh, regarding the external intervention on the part of the, for instance, the uh, United Nations or the U.S., the U.N., DP, United Nations Development Program, uh, the OECD, the European Union, the OECD, they all have flocked into Egypt and Tunisia giving advice on how to move on the transition process. Uh, I'm not sure the, the people in power, I'm sorry I'm going back to the Islamists, are listening. For instance, there's wide consensus in Tunisia on reforming the the judiciary with a a more uh, judicial system, with an independent judiciary, uh, uh, with judges that are better trained and better paid, uh, etc. And that uh, the UN knows how to do that. They've been helping many countries doing it, reforming the judicial system. Uh, There's a wide consensus in Tunisia for that. The Islamists are not doing it. They're not they prefer to keep the system the way it is so they can use it for their own sake, for their own. Same thing with the security sector. It needs to be reformed, undoubtedly. I mean, you have all have heard about how awful the security sector can be there and how uh, 
much they disregard human rights, etc. And we all know, according to our experience elsewhere, that is recorded by the UN how to do it. They are not doing it. And there is a wide, again, consensus in Tunisia among the, the public and the political parties to do that, at least start by doing that. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the issue of econo uh, the economic issue. There are propositions, propo proposals rather, on how to build or devise a new strategy, a new economic development strategy that is a l more inclusive. The debates, they're not doing it. They don't listen. They only are concerned by religious issue and how um, they can Basically, we should not lose. Uh, uh, the, uh, we should keep in mind that their basic agenda is Islamization of the society, not Muslim Islam, but Islamization, meaning, um, <laughs> well, and, and that's their agenda. They, 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 I don't think they. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going back to that. They're not Democrats. They're not there to to build a democratic system the way we elsewhere un un understand it. Their agenda is very different. And I, I, I think now the process is rather stalled because of that kind of approach, attitude. Hopefully, the thing, I mean, it will uh, move forward, but it's not now. It's being stalled because of that. Any questions? Uh, Mike behind you. <coughs> You know, I, I, I think uh, there's no point trying to be to say that we, we have all the indicators and we have a point prediction to make. But uh, Algeria is coming up on a political transition uh, in the next year or so. The president is ill. Uh, there's going to have to be an election. It, something's going to happen there. It may not be masses of people in the streets, but politics is also going to kick in there. As Nathan said, uh, the revival of politics is part of what uh, this Arab awakening is all about. And we're about to see that kick back in in Algeria when this the first generation of revolutionaries finally passed from the scene with Bouteflika's departure. Uh, I think Morocco will have continued pressures for more reforms and deeper reforms. Um, it, it could be the most interesting case of a transition under uh, royal authority to something like a constitu constitutional monarchy. Uh, it's still very much a monarchy monarchy in my view, but I think it has the potential of reforming its way toward uh, a, a, a less, less power concentrated in the, in the uh, king's hands and uh, more in political institutions, and possibly also in Jordan. Uh, these are the places where, I don't know whether we want to call it the next Arab Spring, but where, where the current political system looks to me as if it's poised to move in some direction where there will be more uh, civil involvement, more demands for kind of opening up the political system, uh, for having fairer and more transparent elections. Uh, Jordan just had elections, and the demand is immediately made for the next time they've got to be better and fairer and changing the political system. So uh, these are three places where I think we could, in the next five to ten years, uh, see significant pressures for changes, but not Syrian-style civil wars. Or there's some exhaustion, I think, with just the model of people pouring into the streets and hoping that within a week or so the system will will come tumbling down. Uh, that also isn't going to work. Um, but I think political change is coming, and those are three places that I would watch. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to just to, to make a clear point that I think in all the Arab world we are heading to two things. Republics, eventually we want to see the presidents elected every four years or five years. And monarchies, 
we want to see elected prime ministers checked by the parliament and the monarch is a symbol of the nation more or less uh, a constitutional monarchy so the question is not about uh, which country is next by the way this question if you ask it to any other uh, to any arab leader now this is the terrifying question is it me you know <laughs> and uh, <coughs> and uh, so I, I really will not rule out any of the Arab countries that have gone through the process or are eminent to going through the process being next. Let's not drop, for instance, the GCC countries. Lots of people think that because they have money and they can bribe the people that uh, uh, they will not be affected. Now, there, there are political reasons, geopolitical reasons. For instance, the, the issue in Bahrain. <clears throat> it was su suppressed brutally. Uh, people were, were calling for freedom, exactly like in Egypt. The question why was that uh, made to look as a sectarian battle, especially by the United States, and that those Shiites are supported by Iran, and this is why we will not accept any change in that country, for instance. Take the example of Kuwait. The country is going through a political stagnation. Take the example of Saudi Arabia. The, ki the king is an ailing man, and now they, they, are, they have serious problems about who's going to be in office, and also there is lots of poverty in Saudi Arabia. If you take these elements, you could see some eruption or explosion there. The issue of Jordan, for instance, and I, I would like to, being a Jordanian person here, I'd like to say a couple of points here. The problem is that people are fed up with words and with uh, uh, unmeaningful uh, reforms. The elections that the professor has just mentioned has been done by a retarded law, inward looking, delivering to the Jordanians a parliament not different at all from what we had before. And so basically next morning after the elections, there were lots of question marks about the elections and the outcome, and Jordanians are saying that we have not achieved anything. And so basically, the quality of reform could be an igniting factor to have the people go back to the streets. For instance, in my country, we had over 1,000 demonstrations over the past two years, but probably uh, in, in, in peaceful and in, in organized and properly organized uh, way because Jordanians really don't want to slip with the country to the model that their neighbors in the north, you know, the Syrians had or the Libyans. But at the end of the day, they're not happy, you know, with, with, with what is happening or with the system. Uh, this is why I believe that uh, unless, unless the um, uh, regimes move quickly and address uh, in a substantive and quality-oriented manner the aspiration of the people in freedom, dignity, democracy, pluralism, having the authority vested in the people, I think that we will be having problems in Jordan, in the Gulf area, in Algeria, and, uh, and possibly in Iraq, by the way, and possibly in, uh, in, uh, in Lebanon, for instance. May I just link this to what the young lady just asked about the U.S. role. And here I, I tend to differ with my distinguished colleagues about the ability of the U.S. To, uh, to, to make a difference. Actually, this is the time for the U.S. to make a difference. Why? Because before the Arab masses were suppressed, George Bush tried after the invasion of Iraq to present the a new Middle East uh, plan but it was not the right time, and, they, and it could not been happened. Uh, it, it, it would have. Not, uh, it was difficult to happen, you know, in, with the situation in Iraq and with the military uh, apparatus of the United States. Today, the Arabs, the people, the young men and women on the streets are coming to the international community and telling them on clean slate, "We want freedom." So you have to help us. You cannot look the other way, and. 
in terms of money, there has been lots of initiatives. The EU, for instance, association agreements, the 5 plus 5 for, for the North African countries, the NATO Mediterranean dialogue, the Union for the Mediterranean. What was the problem? Is that, and of course, you know, you had the US free trade agreements with all these countries. What was the problem? Is that all that money was channeled by the US and the EU to the dictators. And they managed to manipulate the Western community and stay in office. Today, the situation is different. This is why I really mentioned the issue of a Marshall Fund. The US has to focus on proper and concrete reform systems in the region and has to put its money where those are serious about reform and aligning it in its interest with the people, not with the regimes or with the leaders, including, for instance, Annahda or Morsi or, or whoever. And I take note, you know, on the speech of President Obama in his reinstatement speech when he said that, you know, the United States will be committed to the Arab peoples who really seek freedom and, uh, and dignity and uh, democracy. And I think that this is very important and very appreciated commitment. commitment. And I hope, you know, that it, it really does not just stay as a lip service because people were really disappointed four years ago with his very famous speech in Cairo. I hope that this time they will not be disappointed. I think that there is a very important um, uh, time in history for the United States to present its values to the people of the Arab world today, not to the regimes. Um, yeah, uh, let me, if I can, sort of, uh, you know, obviously, nobody in this uh, panel is willing to give you a concrete answer, so willing to speculate I'm good, uh, on, on, on a few countries. I will speculate as well. Let me go back to a comment that, or sort of, sort of aphorism, um, um, quote a lot under the Bush administration. Natan Sharansky's town square test. You know, I'll know that a society is free when you can go into the town square and denounce the leader. And when I first heard that, I thought, well, that sounds like a good operational tool. And then I thought, when was the last time I heard a citizen in the Arab country say anything good about their leader? <laughs> and I couldn't think of one. Never. Yeah. The disillusionment with existing political systems is widespread in every single society that I've been in in the region. Um, there are plenty of societies I don't know in the region, but at least in, in, in the ones that I've been in. The question is, when is it when is it translated into some kind of political action? Um, I would give you three candidates, two of which have already been mentioned, of places where I, I, I they kind of re remind me of Egypt in 2005, where, in a sense, politicization is beginning to grow, concrete political demands are being articulated, um, but, it, but it still may be a, a far from anything that would look like a pressure for revolutionary change. Uh, two, two of them have been mentioned, one has not. Uh, Jordan, absolutely. This is a place where I'm, I'm shocked to find the degree to which the corruption issue is big, and the corruption issue is personalized on the king. And the queen. Yes, yeah, and the queen, yes. But, but, but in, in ways it just, it's like people used to talk elliptically, well, we have a, a corruption in this country, there are sort of people around the government. No, it's like, it, I mean, it, it, not in press, but in, pu in public places. Um, um, this to me is, 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 my sense is what is preventing anything from that translating into Jordan in, 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 into action is not necessarily support for the system, but for Jordanian spheres of each other. Okay, there's no real coalition that is possible like there was in Egypt uh, because the society itself is deeply divided along you know, Jordanian, Palestinian, Islamist, non-Islamist lines. Second place is Kuwait, where you actually saw a real upsurge of popular mobilization. It's, it's off, completely off the radar screen, um, uh, but it is one which really focused on fundamental constitutional reform. And the sorts of, by the way, the sorts of demands that people talk about are things like popular government, meaning a, a, a cabinet that is respon politically responsible to an elected uh, uh, parliament. It's something that, you know, sounds like it's straight out of 19th century European political struggles. Um, and the third place would be Palestine. Among Palestinians, there is a strong sense. What is what the problem is there, I think, is that it's not quite clear who it would be directed against. Is it directed internally or externally? And 
as opposed to a place like Jordan, where most p- p- political forces are in Kuwait, the political space in Palestine is occupied. There's two big movements, Hamas and Fatah, that are just sitting there. And the moment any- anybody tries to do anything, they kind of come in and, and, and either suppress the movement or, or, or take it over. But what I see is kind of a consensus among that has developed among Palestinians for over the last four or five years, it says, essentially, we need a new wave of what they're calling popular resistance. Nobody knows what that means or people disagree about what that means, people disagree about what the goals are, people disagree about how to set it off, but my guess is, I mean, again, the level of political dissolution and frustration is so deep, you're going to see some kind of possibilities for upsurge of popular mobilization. What shape it will take, I don't know. Um, But, um, again, off of the radar screen until fairly recently here um, because of the great focus on a peace process. The phrase, the peace process, is one that I have not heard a Palestinian use without derision in about a decade. And it's and, and the same is actually true probably, I would say, among Israelis as well. So because of the great focus on diplomacy here, I think we may be missing what's happening on the ground. Oh, my goodness. Now we're getting more and more questions in the back. Um, I think it kind of came about uh, about uh, gradually. Um, I mean, the revolution itself did have violence against it, but but there there's um, a couple problems that, are, that have fueled it. Number one, um, absence of security sector reform. So the security apparatus is one that knows how to control people one way, and that's very very rough. There's been no attention to it, um, and and the authorities are basically scared to call on it. Um, um, and so on. Second is this kind of uh, um, uh, deep polarization. There is a failure to accept uh, basic rules of 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 of, of uh, the uh, 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 political game, um, and there is a sense, I think, among various political forces, in the sense that sometimes push comes to shove. You saw this in the um, in the last few months when essentially the um, uh, so essentially, in November and December, when uh, President Morsi felt that he was being and the Brotherhood was being directly targeted, that the presidential palace was about to be stormed, that Brotherhood offices were being attacked, and that if they called in the security services, the security services wouldn't defend them, so they called out the Muslim Brotherhood. And essentially, what they started doing was arresting people, beating them up obtaining confessions of dubious reliability and then trying to turn them over for, to, the, to the prosecutor for trial. This was a red line, in a sense, because the president was then relying on essentially what was a party militia. So those were sort, this, the sorts of ways that it happened. Um, I think, I mean, I'm still kind of optimistic on this score. It's not, I mean, it's a society in which arms are much more prevalent, but people do not resort to violence all that easily. You don't have organized militias and this sort of thing, and nobody is talking about starting one. The opposition, the leadership of the opposition in Egypt, I think, is beginning to grapple with this issue and trying to decide is is what we're trying to do to, you know, press for political reform or is what we're trying to do to, to bring down the regime. They're a little bit divided on that issue, but there's some sense that what they have to do is to come up with some sort of set of demands that the that that, that make dialogue possible rather than saying we're out to get you. Um, there, so there is some kind of sense there. To what extent they control their followers is much less clear. But so there 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 are, there are dynamics in Egypt that don't leave me completely pessimistic. If your question is kind of how to draw back, what clearly has to happen is some kind of consensual political process that has credibility. Um, and there have been many attempts at that in Egypt. Um, none have really been successful yet. But 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 I don't I wouldn't necessarily give up hope. Thanks. Um, this question goes to uh, Ambassador Masadeh. Um, the, the idea of intervention was discussed uh, a few moments ago, and uh, I agree with uh, you, sir, that, that you know we don't have the fiscal resources to continue doing that. Um, is it possible to sort of re- reconceptualize the idea of intervention, and perhaps certain programs are, are already underway where uh, you know certain groups of Arab youth uh, throughout the North Africa, the Middle East, are brought to the West, the United States, and 
um, educated, um, sort of encouraged to develop their own form of uh, liberal democratic ideals. I think m many times here in the West, we forgot that the, it was the Islamic civilization through Spain and the Mediterranean that uh, they introduced us to Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato. Is there a certain way that we can reintroduce to the Arab world the Islamic civilization, those ideals, so they can construct their own um, idea, the, the young people? Because I agree with you that you know, the old regime, I mean, you can't teach old dog new trips. It, it, it's, but anyway, so I just was wondering if that's underway somehow. Well, there, there are uh, many initiatives, um, and actually this is the right way forward. Uh, we need to target education, uh, we need to target NGOs, we need to build capacity in nation building, and this is why we have to go in all these initiatives or programs or interventions to the grassroots. And this is why I said that it's time that we overlook dealing with governments uh, or with newly emerging, you know, people in, uh, in the power. Um, also, I believe that one of the formidable tools that the US or the EU can do, for instance, is also to target the uh, in, uh, capacity enhancement of political parties. Because you see in our system, unfortunately due to the um, autocratic regimes that we had, the countries have been turned into rentier states whereby you don't have citizens, you have subjects. And you have um, a very absurd relationship between the leader and the subject. Everything is given as a grant. And so also you create people who are dependent on the state, but not dependent on themselves. This is why, for instance, you take the example of Jordan. Everybody wants to work for the government. And the private sector is not functioning. Also, that system created or divided the countries in general into tribes. So rather than to think on political ideologies and policies, you have the people thinking on the tribal relationship between each other. And this is why I believe that focusing on political parties, on NGOs, by way of having programs from the United States to the countries in transition is very important. Now I, I would like to add my voice to the level of suspicion and criticism that you will have from the people towards anything coming from, from the West. But I think that we can, we can overtake this with, with time because you know there is lots of mistrust. Uh, wh why are they coming to us? To do what? Again, you know, we are embedded with the conspiracy theory in our region. Uh, but I believe that, uh, you know, the target has to be uh, for and, and to the younger generation. 70% of the Arab population is under the age of 40. This is a very important opportunity. And I believe that education, universities, uh, um, is, is, is the gateway for all of this to start building not just democracy but the ability to accept the other something that we don't have in our tradition unfortunately because of the way the system was created